Hey folks, hi Grace Summit, how are you doing? Welcome to Wednesday Night Live, and uh, we're on part two of a series through the book of Proverbs, and so I'd invite you to grab a Bible and turn it to Proverbs chapter one. Uh, last week we saw just kind of the introductory remarks, uh, the, the thesis statement of the book of Proverbs, that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. It begins with the relationship. Wisdom is rooted not in book learning or in uh, just life experience or in even just kind of religious ritual. It's in a relationship. And we know as New Testament believers that that's a relationship with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look further into the book of Proverbs, we see the call of foolishness. There is a danger out there because there is a call in our lives to do to work contrary to this wisdom. And again, as New Testament believers, we recognize this as the flesh, as just kind of our, our fallen nature, that we're beings that have fallen into sin. As Romans chapter 5 says, death spread to all mankind because of one man's sin. And, and because of that, we're born with this kind of proclivity towards not, not good, but towards evil. So we're not really this blank slate, but uh, when we're covenanted with God, we become that kind of simple-minded person who needs to be trained in doing wisdom over foolishness. There's still always going to be this call of foolishness. I'd invite you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 8. And we're, we've called this resisting the call of foolishness. So look at verse 8. It says simply this, Hear, my son, your father's instructions, and forsake not your mother's teaching. So this verse calls to mind this imagery of a father and mother teaching their children how to practice wisdom and probably in your home is where you learned most of your foundations of your worldview for, for better or for worse the home is the primary place for passing down wisdom and truth and understanding that's why godly home discipleship is vital if you've done anything at uh, at this time in quarantine I hope it's been sit at the living room table or the the kitchen table wherever you are and looked at the Word of God together as a family. I hope that you've prayed together more than you did before. I, I hope that there's been some sort of home discipleship that you've uh, taken advantage of. If you don't know how to do that, I would like to help you to do that. So just as the book of Proverbs brings up this imagery, it's really a convicting idea to me that the home is supposed to be the place of discipleship. And as New Testament believers, as disciples and followers of Jesus, I believe that's still the case. I believe that the home is the primary place where disciple-making happens, and the church helps to facilitate that disciple-making process. Uh, my, my job as a father is to dis make disciples out of my children. And, uh, in fact, my leadership capacity within the church, in the offices of the church, whether pastor or deacon, is measured to some degree by my ability to do that in the home. Uh, if, if I am not being responsible over my job to make disciples in the home. Uh, I shouldn't be granted a position to serve in the office of the church. And so uh, that becomes very, very important. So maybe this quarantine is a time for you to practice good habits. Let's look further in this introduction. He says, for they, uh, that is the instruction of a father or mother, are like a garland, a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Wisdom beautifies your life. Wisdom makes your life beautiful. Uh, we see that in 1 Peter chapter 3, I believe, where it speaks to, to wives. That don't, don't let your, your beauty be of outward appearance, uh, the decorating of your hair and all these things, wearing of fine jewelry, but let, let it be the, the piece of the, the inward spirit and that wisdom that takes place and that good character. Um, when I was in college, the information that I learned in my college classes, particularly in, in uh, junior college, I threw, I just, I just, chuck that stuff out of my head right after the test. I, I would store up information in my head, but I would never wear it like a garland. I would never put it like a pendant around my neck. I would store it in my memory just long enough to take the final, and then I would just, I, just get away from me. I need to play video games, you know, I don't know. Whatever you do whenever you're in college, right? And so, uh, I regret that, but wisdom is not just for the classroom, but for life. We need to take in this knowledge and make it a part of us and make it part of our life. So 
The encouragement is to hold wisdom close to us, to wear it like a pendant. Why? Because there are going to be situations where you're going to need that wisdom. That's the focus of this text. I want to show you the offer of foolishness now. I want to read this to you. He says, My son, if sinners entice you, verse 10, do not consent. Don't, don't go with them. And then he offers this scenario of foolishness, the, the call of foolishness uh, on a person's life. He, he presents this scenario. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, that's kind of the realm of the dead. Let us swallow them alive and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will have one purse together. And so I want you to see the three offers of foolishness here. And in each one, you can find yourself being drawn to and falling into. The first one, if, if you look at the highlighted parts of that verse, I think is the call of excitement. Uh, and, and with that excitement might be a, a sense of control, the ability to act on impulse, to not think through issues, but just the excitement of just acting on impulse, just, just doing whatever. And uh, what First John chapter 4 calls the lust of the flesh, just kind of going with what feels good, right? And, and so there's a temptation in the moment of excitement. It's the pull towards the affair. The, it's towards the spending more than what is wise, comfort spending, uh, to eating more than what is wise. A, a lot of us know about that in quarantine. I'm going to tell you, I know about that in quarantine. I feel like watching myself on these videos is progressively watching myself get fatter. It's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. Y'all should record yourself uh, twice a week because uh, that'll keep you in check, right? Uh, I sense in here also a pull of impulse just to go out and do whatever. Hey, come with us. And, and let's go and just, let's just go kill somebody. I mean, that's really how wicked their thought process is. But let's go do something exciting. Let's go feel like we're in control, even of life and of death. It's really a wicked and depraved thought. Uh, to, it's a feeling of, of wanting that control, of having controlling power, even as of death. The plan is even communicated to appear safe and easy yet thrilling. And so there's a pull towards excitement. Uh, this is, you know, it, it's boring to be good. <laughs> it's boring to do what God says. It's, it's boring to, um, to be wise. It's much more exciting to do the foolish things it's out of the ordinary. It's out of what is expected of me. And so does the pull of, of that false sinful excitement. Uh, next, I want you to see uh, this, this sinful companionship. Or what First John chapter 4 again says, maybe the pride of life. Just being accepted by the world, being accepted by peers. This is good old-fashioned peer pressure here. They say, come with us. And, and I hear in that, come on, let's just be cool. Do what we're doing, right? It's cliche, but uh, it, it's, it works in dragging many into foolishness. You know, be cool with us. Do what we're doing. Join with us. Throw in your lot among us, and we will have one purse. We're all going to walk away with benefit. We're brothers in this. We're going we're gonna to share and share alike, right? Uh, you just need to do your share. And, and I confess to you that many of my worst decisions I've ever made have been with friends. <laughs> and just the, the peer pressure of the moment, and, I, and I'm not saying that I've been innocent, but that's a justification in doing those things. But there really is this pull of going with the crowd, of, man, everyone else is doing this, maybe I should do this. Or just feeling the need to want to have that ease of being accepted, by what the world says. The world says a lot of things that are contrary to what God says. And there is this temptation of, man, it would be so much easier to go with the flow. Uh, and, and, but only dead things go upstream, right? Go with the stream. Uh, only alive things swim against the stream. And so uh, be careful that you're doing the right thing with that. See, uh, the next one I want to show you is the pull towards wealth, or what First John chapter 4 might call the lust of the eyes. And uh, the plan ends with precious goods and houses full of plunder. They're going to they're gonna go wait, and they're going to go steal and kill if they have to. And it's going to end with just riches and majesty and glory, right? Is that, is that, do you think that's how that's going to work out, right? But there's a desire to get what we need and what we want without any recourse to our actions. This is why Paul says, or one of the reasons why Paul says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I can show you that. 
In 1 Timothy 6.10, notice it says, uh, the love of money. It doesn't say money in general. Money is amoral. It's just a thing. Uh, objects really aren't evil or, or not evil. Um, and, and yet, the love of money, this, this desirous idolatrousness towards money, this covetousness towards uh, possessions, is a root of not all evil, but all kinds of evil. See how we misquote uh, that? We say money is the root of all evil. Well, it doesn't say that. No, it says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Much of what is evil to be done is because of this desire, this animalistic desire to have enough resources or have more than we need. And this greed of amassing things that we ultimately don't need. But the book of Proverbs points to wealth being, true wealth being found in wisdom. It says, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from wisdom and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Nothing wrong about money. Uh, nothing wrong about being successful in money in the right way, but this desirousness towards money is, is not where life is found. It's not where freedom is found, where uh, true joy comes from. But true joy comes in finding the way of Jesus and following the way of Jesus and following in the way of wisdom. That's where riches is. Now, I want to point you to the way of wisdom is what the writer points us to next. It says, don't follow these guys. Don't do that. Don't fall into this trap. So I've titled this, this, this section, uh, also known as, What Foolishness Fails to Tell You. And it says, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. You notice it's here... Specifically, it's unjust gain, right? Uh, there, is a, there is a good thing to, uh, to be wise with money, to work hard and to earn so that you can provide for your family. But someone who is greedy for unjust gain, that always ends in the wrong way. It takes away the life of its possessors. So verse 15 encourages to, us to cut off temptation at the root, to go ahead and don't, don't even walk on the, don't even set foot on that path. Don't go down that road. Um, it's a treacherous path of foolishness. And I want you to see two reasons why. Uh, this is what foolishness fails to tell you. Number one is, is the backfire. It's not going to work out, right? They, they think that they have a sense of control in this, that they, they really have a good plan. But their plan will not ultimately work out for their good. They aren't even as smart as a bird, uh, the, book, the writer of Proverbs says. He says, the bird realizes that a trap is being set in front of him. And when he sees that a trap is being set in front of him, he flies away. But these guys, uh, they're setting a trap, but the trap is only going to ensnare them. Uh, it's going to backfire on them. Uh, they're, they're ensnared by their own behavior, either in this life or the next. Foolishness comes back to haunt you. Their operation is sloppy. And even if they succeed in the present, they will reap what they sow. Uh, God has kind of put that into creation where uh, we observe the, the rule of the farmer that we reap what we sow. That's different than to say that karma is some sort of mystic force that operates in the universe. Uh, we don't, we don't uh, suggest that, but we do suggest that uh, God here in the now, in times and seasons, gives us according to what we have done. However, there is a day when ultimate justice is doled out, and uh, the ones who have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life are forgiven of their sin. And, and the rest are judged according to that sin. Secondly, I want you to see the slippery slope. Now, usually when we say slippery slope, like in logic classrooms, that's a fallacy where we try to suggest that an argument is wrong because uh, of uh, an extreme view that, we could, that it could lead to, right? Um, but there is a slippery slope in foolishness. Foolishness is a path. And the writer of Proverbs says, don't even set foot on that path. Why? Because their feet run fast to evil. Man, that path leads straight to evil, and they will run fast to it on that path. The Apostle Paul even quotes this verse, or partially, in Romans chapter 3, verse 15, to show the wickedness of humanity and their need for a Savior. It's because foolishness runs fast towards evil, and it doesn't look back. Sin entangles so easily in the formation of these people's character uh, through the continuous practice of foolishness and sin becomes their undoing. Don't set foot on their path because you don't want to form a character that way. 
uh, the teacher once told me, you play, uh, you play like you practice. And I've always kind of said that around the house as kind of a maxim, as kind of a, a mantra of sorts, uh, because you do. Even if you uh, fail to do the assignments, that doesn't mean you're going to do good on the test, right? You think, well, I'm just not going to do the homework assignments because when it comes to test time, I'm going to really cram, I'm really going to study. Well, you play like you practice, right? And when it comes to the small things, even the insignificant things, don't set foot on the way of foolishness. Why? Because you are setting up a precedent for yourself. Practice out what it means to be wise, even in the small things. So when, when it comes to the big things, you'll be found faithful. Um, the Old Testament and New Testament both say, bad company ruins good character. Your friends are only as good as how they build you up. Of course, we all need lost friends in our lives, someone to witness to, but uh, the, you, you know who the influencers in your life are. You know who has a hold on your heart and who you are accountable to and who you want to shape your character to be like. And we long for those people to be people that are righteous and wise and have good character traits uh, that will help us to be successful in God's mission for us. So I just want to encourage you in that way. And uh, I hope this is meaningful to you as we walk through this in just kind of short bites. And I, I just pray a great week for you. And uh, I think we'll do this for um, as long as God has us in this capacity. So it's going to end up being a kind of a full-fledged series. So I hope that you tune in on Wednesdays and catch us here and uh, just interact with our material. If this is good... You like it, comment on it, share it, and uh, you'll see this, catch us on YouTube, and uh, you can catch all of our videos on the website now, and I, I appreciate the guys for doing all of that, and uh, I just want to pray for you, and I hope you have a great week. Father, we just love you, and uh, we thank you for today, and we thank you, Lord, that through your Son and through your Holy Spirit, you can help us discern these wise and foolish things, Lord. Uh, th there is so much pull in our lives every day. And maybe some are experiencing now in the, as we experience this idea of, you know, uh, idle hands or the devil's workshop as we have this new life where we uh, don't have many of the, the busy activities that we usually do. Uh, Father, we just pray that we might continue to work in wise ways, Lord. And there's a call of foolishness that promises excitement. It promises easy money. Uh, and it promises companionship. Uh, but Lord, we... We want to flee from that. We don't want to step foot on that path because, uh, Lord, those foolish ways backfire and they lead to a formation of character. Even when we flirt with it, it leads to a, uh, a formation of character down the road that we don't want to, we don't want to practice. So help us in our lives in the ways that uh, we fall short of that. Would you forgive us and would you help us by your Spirit to walk in the ways that are delightful to you and bring you much glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys. I hope that you have a great week. God bless you.